shadow from the forest. You might want to get a study, guys, because we're talking about you the They will stare underneath. And next week, Pixie does. At the last unicorn. When the first breath of winter through the flowers is icing, and you look to the north, if you guys want, you can go ahead and say, the and then go to the next slide. Uh, we really are going to be talking about unicorns tonight, and then uh, next week we're going to be talking, uh, we're going to be looking in the Bible about uh, Leviathan and Behemoth. What the monkey were those things? Not monkeys. Uh, uh, I think we're going to be looking at uh, giants, Nephilim, and uh, one of the weeks, what was the other, babe? Nephilim, Leviathan, everything was fine now, it's echoing, turn monitors. Uh, Leviathan, Behemoth is next week. Uh, uh, giants, Nephilim, another week. Uh, tonight, uh, unicorns, leprechauns. No, go ahead. Can you turn all the monitors off behind me, or at least mine? Okay. All right. Uh, and there's another one. I don't remember what, uh, but we'll be just for fun. Oh, UFOs. UFOs in the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> did you see one? I did. And I don't believe it when I saw it. It was cool. But we'll talk about that then. Um, men's breakfast Saturday, right? Because I'm coming, so all right. Ladies, kitchen talk, not this Saturday, but next Saturday? Yes. Yes. Does that mean you're at the office this Saturday? Yes. Yes, okay. Baptisms, uh, not until uh, September, uh, but uh, I've already been talking to folks who are getting in line. So next in line? So we're praying for those folks. Uh, pray for each other. Of course, uh, some of you uh, were here when we mentioned that Marianne uh, Martinez, who hadn't been coming very long, uh, was baptized here a couple of months ago and uh, had prayed to give her life to the Lord but hadn't been baptized and uh, was baptized here. And uh, she would stay after the services uh, every, every Sunday when she could. She had a lot of health problems, uh, was actually uh, on a waiting list for a liver transplant. And anyway, she passed away Saturday night. And uh, the family asked if we could help with a funeral service. So uh, we'll have a funeral service here for Marianne Saturday at 6 o'clock, Saturday evening, 6 o'clock. So if you're so inclined to come or come to help set up before, uh, Jerry's going to uh, uh, oversee. I think we're going to be preparing for about 60 people. We'll have a meal for them, uh, uh, probably, a sandwich, probably what we did this last Sunday, sandwiches and such. So if you'd like to help with that, uh, get with Jerry just so he knows who's going to be here. Uh, if, if for some reason, if you can come and you can hang out afterwards, we'll have to get everything squared away for church Sunday morning. So her, her service will be here at 6 o'clock. If you can be here before that, great. If you can be here during that, would be wonderful. If you can be here after. Uh, so the service will be from 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock. Okay. Uh, pray for rain. Got lots of rain the other night, huh? I don't know if we kind of went overboard on that, but no, no. Bring the rain. Still praying for 10 inches over the state, so I don't know how they figure that stuff. What's that? Yeah, just start building a boat, baby. Uh, so pray for each other. Pray for your families. Pray for Marianne's family. Pray for your church. Uh, uh, I, I, I pray for rain. Yeah? All right. Father, thank you uh, for hearing us. Thank you for uh, watching over us. Thank you for providing rain. Thank you for providing food. Thank you for providing uh, breath. Thank you for providing uh, this life. And God, we are especially grateful that you've given to us new life. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for using us. Thank you for changing us. Thank you for preparing us for whatever work, whatever ministry you have for us. We love you. We praise you. We can't wait to watch you work in our lives uh, more and more each day, moment by moment. God, uh, continue to move us. Continue to speak to us. Continue to change us. Use us. Use us. Use us. In your name we pray. Amen. Watch this next video and then we're going to find out what you think I think about what we think. Like something out of a Stephen King novel, a Syracuse woman was declared dead and as her body lay on the operating table to have her organs harvested, she opened her eyes to the glare of the operating lights and doctors standing over her holding scalpels. In 2009, 41-year-old Colleen Burns was admitted to St. Joseph's Hospital Health Center in Syracuse, New York after suffering a drug overdose. She was later pronounced dead. 
The Post Standard recently broke the story after getting a report through the Freedom of Information Act. That report by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services revealed a number of mistakes made by doctors at the hospital. According to the report, when Burns was brought into the ER, specialists recommended treating her with activated charcoals to stop her body from absorbing the drugs, but that reportedly never happened. Which Fox News reports led to the possibility that Burns kept absorbing the pills into her system. After over a week at the hospital, she started suffering from seizures, but head CT scans revealed that everything was still normal. It was also revealed doctors ignored nurses' observations that Burns was not dead and her condition was improving. One indication was that Burns passed a reflex test. If that's not creepy enough, right before going into the operating room, Burns' nostrils were flaring like she was breathing and her lips and tongue moved. 20 minutes later, the nurse reportedly gave Burns a sedative and wheeled her into the OR. After the incident, which everyone survived, the hospital was fined $9,000. And as much as we'd like to give you a happy ending to this story, unfortunately, about a year after her narrow escape, Burns took her own life. Did you guys catch that? So she had a drug overdose. They took her into the ER. It was recommended that they give her activated charcoal. The activated charcoal absorbs the medicine so that not so much gets absorbed through your system, but they didn't give it to her for some reason. She was in the hospital for a week. She was an organ donor. They declared her dead, wheeled her to the operating room to harvest the organs. That's what they call it when they take out the organs. While she, before she ever was being wheeled to the operating room, one of the nurses, they do a test. I don't know if you saw it where they take something up against the foot to see whether the toes go down or up. It tells you about brain activity. And the nurses reported to the doctors, we don't think she's dead. She has brain activity shown by this test, and they, according to this, ignored it. I don't know reality, but they, well, must have ignored it somewhat because they tried to take her organs. And then while they were wheeling her to the operating room, her nostrils were flaring as if she were breathing. Um, and then she was moving her mouth and her tongue, and they gave her a sedative. Why do you give someone dead a sedative? They gave her a sedative took her to the operating room. This is real life. And before they cut her open, she opened her eyes. Now, I've only been a part of one organ harvesting. It was a 15-year-old. He was here at, in Albuquerque, 15-year-old in front of a middle school, of course, over a girl. He shot himself in the head. And I was an anesthesia resident. And so I was in on the case where we wheeled him to the operating room and um, they did. I mean, you're, you're watching. Our job was to keep the heart rate, blood pressure, temperature all very, very stable. They, they were talking about how critical it is to keep their heart rate, blood pressure, and temperature stable because you want to keep the organs fresh. And so we're focusing on the monitors. We're doing all of this. I was a resident, uh, meaning under training by my attending. The attending is the main doctor and then the residents. And then my attending walked up and turned off the monitors. I mean, that was like, that was everything I was doing. That was my job. And walked up and just turned off the monitors and the surgeon snip, snip the beating heart. When they harvest the organs, I mean, the heart was beating. Um, I don't remember in his case, I think the machines were breathing for him, but his heart was beating and they took out the organs. Now, what do you think he thinks? Or what do you think, we actually agree on this one for the most part. What do you think we think generally about organ donation? You should be dead first. I, I agree with that, Vince. You should be dead first. You think we think it's a good thing, bad thing, neutral thing? I mean, after you see this, then obviously you're going to want to say a bad thing. But in general, do you, what, do you think my, what do you think his driver's license says? Do you think it has an organ donation thing on his? What do you think? Everyone who says yes, he probably does. Everyone who says no, he probably doesn't. Losers. Okay. His does. What do you think mine says? Do you think mine says organ don donation or no organ? Yes, organ donation. No organ donation. No. Yes, mine says organ donation. Yeah. That's exactly right. No kidding. When we renew our licenses, based on this and other things, Donna has sent me things in, Tony things in, the, in emails before, looking at these exact situations, 
And in a way, I think, oh, they're so few and far between. After this organ uh, harvesting of the 15-year-old, I got a letter in the mail probably six months later. And it was, I don't want to say wonderful, but it was, um, it was amazing. Amazing is much better than wonderful, right? A letter basically saying, thank you for participating in this person's organ harvesting. We wanted to give you an update of what this gift was able to do for so many families. And there were five different people who were like Marianne being on the waiting list of a liver. One got a liver, one I think got kidneys, maybe even two got kidneys, one a heart, maybe the lungs. There were at least five different people. One was a nurse, one was a father. I mean, and it gave you enough personal information where you feel like, you know, thank you, Lord, that these people could have been, that these people were saved because of this young man's bad decision, but at least this bad decision didn't just, it's just gone, it's just, um, I remember when I was in the ER in Roswell, there was a six-year-old, I believe he was six, and um, he was in a car accident. He, from ever, I, I don't remember all the tests that we had done, but I basically thought, oh, th he was under state custody. I think he was a foster kid. Under state custody, and they were going to unplug him from the ER because of this car accident or something that he, I, I'm almost positive it was a car accident. They were going to unplug him. And I fought and fought and fought for organ donation. I kept saying, don't just unplug this kid. There are kids that are dying. There are kids that are waiting for these organs. Now, if they, now if they just would have unplugged my 15-year-old patient, what would have happened to him? He would have died. He would have died. These five people's lives wouldn't have been saved, and he would have died. What happened when they unplugged this six-year-old boy in the ER in Roswell? He died. Now, is there anything wrong with recognizing the proposition that someone is only being kept alive by machines, is there anything wrong with taking them off the machines so that their body can stop? No. There's nothing inherently evil. There's nothing wrong with if someone's not breathing on there. I agree with Vince. I think, think they need to be dead. That's a hard one. I mean, that's obviously a hard one, that it's still happening today. Tony's talked about before that the whole reason that, that we embalm today is because the main reason, that's a, probably a better way to say it, that the main reason we embalm today is, or one of the reasons that we embalm is because there are so many, so many cases of people um, being uh, disinterred, is that what it's called? Exhumed? Uh, for whatever reason, they were going to do an autopsy, and they find scratch marks on the coffin. They find hair pulled out in between the fingers. They see joints dislocated, trying to get out. There was one of my ER physicians, my ER attendings in Tucson, when I did my emergency medicine training in Tucson, uh, Ken Iverson wrote a book, uh, How We Die, something is it how we die? I remember reading it when I was doing my ICU rotation at UNM. I was reading this book. It was unbelievable. And story after story after story of people who were buried. I mean, they started burying people with bells so that if they woke up, they could ring a bell to alert people to come exhume the body. Because it's not as easy as you'd think to know when someone has died. I mean, in the old days, you'd think it would be easy when they stopped breathing and their heart stops beating. They're dead. But it's not so simple. Sometimes the heart starts beating again one time. Tony hates when I tell these stories because I'm always here. There was one time, and it, it's just so hard. I mean, their heart stops. They're not breathing. Their EKG is flat. I mean, it's a pretty good indication that they're gone. Well, you start CPR. You start giving them the epi. You start giving them the atropine. You're giving them the lidocaine. You're doing all this stuff. Well, if their heart stops, their flatline, no, nothing's really going through their system. So you give them the medication, it stays there. And you're pumping on their chest. You're trying to move things. It just stays there. So you wait a couple minutes. You keep pumping. You keep doing whatever you need to do. And if, not, if you don't get any response, at some point, you look at the clock and you say, time of death, 644. Did they really die at 644? Did they die at 642? Did they, uh, who knows? But it's when the doctor looks at the clock and says, time of death, 644. 
and I called the death, and I was talking to the family. As I was talking to the family, the nurses walked up and said, Doc Dr. Chavez, can we speak to you a minute? Sure, just a minute. No, like right now. I'm very sorry. Excuse me. And I walked back into the room, and his EKG was moving again. It's like the whatever, the, the, whatever, the epi or the atropine, whatever we'd given him last final, it started kicking in. And so we worked the code again. We, we kept trying to keep him alive, keep him alive, keep him alive. It would stop again. I let it go for a long time then. Keep working that code, keep trying, keep trying, keep trying, keep trying, keep trying. And after 10, 15, 20 minutes, it's like, okay, it's done. This is done. And I mean, and he did, he did die. He had lots of issues. Um, there are times where I, there was another one who was dead. You pronounce a death. But they have something sometimes 30, 40 minutes later called agonal respirations, where all of us, I mean, they haven't breathed in 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and all of a sudden, oh, they're still not awake, they're still not alive, they're still not, it's like this, this reflex, like this diaphragm uh, spasm, this reflex that makes them gasp. Well, I was in the patient's room with the family. Now, with the person, from everything medical we know, they were dead. Heart wasn't beating, nothing was going on. It's almost like a, a twitch. Like Tony has shown a video before of frog legs and um, cut off the frog's frog legs and you sprinkle salt on it and just the sodium and the muscle contraction, they start kicking around. Obviously the frog isn't alive or maybe the frog is, but his leg isn't. It's been cut off and sitting there. But now the family didn't see those respirations, thank you, Lord. I mean, I was really freaked out because if that were me, I would have thrown a fit. I mean, I, what are you supposed to think? He's not dead. Uh, I mean, I would have thrown an absolute fit. Um, I freaked out not because I thought he was alive, but because I didn't want the family to see that and think otherwise. But it is difficult. So what do you do? I mean, in the case of the 15-year-old, if they would have pulled the plug, he would have died and none of those people would have benefited from his organs. But wow, wow. So I don't know how to, I've always been bad at these, what do you think I think, because there's no actual conclusion, but do you want to say anything about that? Do you want to? Oh, he was saying that, I think your mic's off, but oh, okay. He was saying that our position on organ donation is kind of like living wills. It's not, we don't have living wills. I, I actually am not an advocate of living wills. There's nothing wrong with them necessarily. We can talk about it another time. But um, I think that you should talk to your loved ones about what you want and tell them what you want because I've been in positions in the ER where somebody comes with a DNR, DNI order and I want to intubate them so badly because we may be able to fix this. I had someone with pneumonia and they had a DNI order, and we were getting ready to intubate them, and the wife said, wait, no, he has a DNI order. Well, did he actually think that it was going to be because he has pneumonia? I mean, something that we could potentially fix? And my hands were tied until I convinced her, look, he might die. I might intubate him and put him on antibiotics. He might be in the ICU, and he might still die. I can guarantee you if I don't intubate him, he's going to die. And it's possible. I don't know likely, but possible if we intubate him and put him on antibiotics. But... So I've been in positions where my hands have been tied before. Um, and I've been in positions where it's up to the doctor's discretion that I didn't agree with the doctor's discretion. So I don't have a living will. Tony doesn't have a living will. We know what each other want. I think it's important to tell other people what you want because what if we both die in a car accident? Now, is God in control? Yes. But we're on this earth, and we have to make some decision, and it just makes sense to think it through. Tony was saying organ donation. He feels about it like, and so do I, about living wills. Do, would I rather, if, if I'm truly brain dead, you know, let's say, let's just say for extreme examples, let's say I'm decapitated for extreme examples. I'm not going to come back, okay? But my heart is still beating and the transplant team is right there. Am I going to say take my organs? Yes, take them. I don't need them anymore. Let somebody else have a shot at life because maybe they're going to die and go to hell if they die now, but maybe they're going to get my organ and live for another 20 years and maybe they'll get saved. I mean, it's all up to God and them, and, but shoot, if you can use my organs, take them. But I agree with Vince. Make sure I'm dead first. That would be horrifying, and I don't want to leave it up to the doctor's discretion like in this video where they say, yeah, I 
think she's probably dead. I mean, there are ways to check the electrical activity in a brain that apparently weren't done. Just, and, and they're usually not done, to tell you the truth. I got called to pronounce so many deaths. When I was in the ER, they would say, could you come pronounce a death on the medical floor? Could you please come pronounce a death on the surgical floor? And you go up and you have certain things, you know, 10 or so things that you do to try to verify a death and you call the death. I'm not hooking up, you know, EEGs to their brain. I'm not checking brain stem activity. I'm not doing any of those things. I'm just checking all the basic things and I would look at the clock, call the death and they'd call the family. Um, so make sure your loved ones know what you want uh, there's nothing wrong with giving organs. I think there's everything right with giving organs. Just make sure you have control uh, as much as possible, that you and God have control, not the doctors, not the... I mean, they, they do a good job, but cool? All right, let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are in control of our bodies. Our bodies are fearfully and wonderfully made. And God, we need to be ready to go tonight if that's what you want. God, I pray that you would give us wisdom in the things that we can control. God, that we would take care of our bodies and that we would use them for your glory and your honor. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good job. I'll make sure you're gone first before I give any of your parts away. You witnessed that. You all heard that. <laughs> we'll save the head and make soup or something. All right. What do unicorns look like? Is there such a thing as a unicorn? What's the next video there? Is there such a thing as a unicorn? These are real pictures, right? But they look so pretty. Shetland pony unicorn. All right, how many of you believe in unicorns? How many of you don't believe in unicorns? <laughs> All the guys with the rainbows in the back. <laughs> okay, next one, next, uh, next video. Seen as believing, right? This is a skeleton. Don't show close up here. The skeleton of, a, of an animal. It's not chupacabra, it's got a thing. So, is it true? Okay, if you don't believe yet, check this out. This was on TV, so it's got to be true. All right, now an eyebrow-raising announcement out of North Korea. The state news agency there claims that archaeologists have just located an ancient unicorn lair. NBC's Michelle Kaczynski has more on that. Michelle, explain, please. <laughs> Yes, Matt, we mere mortals only know unicorns in legend and song, but in North Korea, also in some ways something of a mythical place, and so few ever see it, they claim to have found what purports to be a real unicorn hideout. In the secrecy-shrouded land of revered dear leaders who point at things, so this, this is pretty recent. military demonstrations, missile tests, and an enormous empty hotel, North Korea now adds another feather to its dictatorial cap. This one explosive only in its weirdness. The Korean Central News Agency at the same time is reporting such nuggets as banquet given and new kinds of saunas appear in Pyongyang, reveals something else has appeared in the capital on a hill, an ancient unicorn lair. Now that's something to point at. The article quotes archaeologists as actually reconfirming the discovery, saying a rectangular rock carved with the words unicorn lair stands in front of the lair. The carved words that are believed to date it, back right. to the period of the Koryo Kingdom, 918 to 1392. The intent behind this is to try to bolster up the credentials of the young leader who is still in his 20s. Uh, North Korea likes to make the claim that heroic blood runs in the family, References to unicorns do appear throughout history across many cultures. Ancient Greece, the Bible, European literature, Toys R Us. Hey, Charlie! And of course, the web. Of course, the web. Those of us who have been saved a little while, uh, got saved and were in church using uh, King James Bibles. Amen. Glory. Some of you guys still like using King James Bibles. In the King James Bible, you find, first of all, in Numbers chapter 23, verse 22. God brought them out of Egypt. 
he hath as it were the strength of an unicorn numbers 24 8 god brought him forth out of egypt he hath as it were the strength of a unicorn same thing huh? he shall eat up the nations his enemies he shall break their bones pierce them through with arrows deuteronomy 33 17 his glory like the firstling of the of his bullock the first of the bulls huh? and his horns are like the horns of unicorns with them he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth and they are the ten thousands of ephraim they are the thousands of manasseh job 39 9 will the unicorn be willing to serve thee or abide by thy crib Canst thou bind the unicorn with his band in the furrow? Will he uh, harrow the valleys after thee? Psalm 22, 21. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorn. Psalm 29, 6. He maketh them also to skip like a calf, Lebanon and Syrian, like a young unicorn. Psalm 92, 10. Didn't know the Bible talks so much about unicorns, did you? But mine horn shall uh, thou exalt like the horn of an unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. And finally, Isaiah 34, 7. And the unicorns shall come down with them, and the bullocks with the bulls, and their land shall be soaked with blood, and their dust made fat with fatness. All right? So the Bible talks about unicorns. I, I, I just thought over the next couple of weeks we would talk about things that seem a little fantastic. I, I, you know, I'm not really hung up on whether there are unicorns or UFOs or things like that. They might be interesting or not. One of the reasons I thought it would be kind of fun to do this for the next couple of weeks is because this is just another way to encourage each other to get into the Word. Because that's what Wednesday night Bible study is about. It's not so much to tell you what I believe. You know me. I'll tell you. I can't help myself. The most important thing is not getting you to believe what I believe. The most important thing is to get us all into the Word so that we believe what God believes, right? The Bible does talk about unicorns. But, you know, that was, this is from a 400-year-old book, the King James, the authorized version of King James, 1611, glory! Well, we're all grown up now. We've got real grown-up Bibles, right? Yeah. It's God's Word or it's not God's Word. Uh, so, based on the passages that we just read, and I know we just kind of glossed over them but could this be a unicorn we see pictures of something like this now when you think unicorn isn't that the picture you get in your mind it's a horse with a pico with a yeah how many horns one just one not two that's yeah, a whole other thing so could that be what the Bible's talking about no what about the other? could this be a unicorn like a lap dog no what why do you think this couldn't be a unicorn. Because we saw the picture in the back. Because <laughs> we already saw a real Polaroid of a unicorn. Well, listen, listen to a passage like this. Uh, just stay where you are on the slide. But Will the unicorn be willing to serve you? Can you get the unicorn to lie down and sleep wherever you wanted to? Can you tie up the unicorn? Can you get the unicorn tamed so it will uh, plow your fields? Can you hold the unicorn wherever you want to hold the unicorn. The, the Bible talks about the unicorn like it's a strong mammer jammer. That doesn't look like a, that's not, that's a puppy. Yeah. Most of the pictures that we see of unicorns today tend to be something what? Uh, they're, they're mystical, they're fictional, um, ethereal, right? Usually a white uh, horse, you know, equine creature, uh, long flowing hair and boop. Yeah. Um, again, keep in mind, the whole, reason, the whole reason that we do Bible study is to encourage us to study the Bible. It's not so much to, to persuade you to believe what I believe. It's not so much just to you know, fill an hour, oh, what are we going to talk about this week? I mean, we ask those questions, but we really wrestle with it and we pray about it because I want to encourage you just like I appreciate when you encourage me. You encourage me when, when you track with me, when I'm teaching, when you ask me great Bible questions, when you ask me crazy Bible questions. It, it spurs me on. It encourages me, and I love it, I love it, I love it. When I ask a question like, could this be a unicorn, it kind of doesn't matter. What does matter is if the passages in Scripture talk about the unicorn as something like it's real. For example, did Jonah swallow a whale? Did a whale swallow Jonah? Yes. No. Was a fish. Oh, that was a trick. Oh, that was a trick question. The Bible says that Jonah was swallowed by a fish, a great fish. Now, we assume whale, but it's not what it says. So it, it's, good to, it's good to pay attention to these things. Was Jonah eaten by a fish? No. He was swallowed by a fish. 
he was you know, he's like, he was alive in the belly of that fish for three days at three nights. That was a picture of Jesus' death. Three days later, he rose from the dead, right? So I think the other one maybe could be a unicorn, but I don't think this one could be a unicorn. But does it matter? What really matters to me is what we do with passages that don't make any sense. What do you do with passages that seem old-fashioned and, and nobody believes that stuff anymore? Well, maybe we should believe in unicorns or whatever, right? That, that's really a, a better question. Could this be the unicorn? It's called a narwhal. It's a fish. It has one long tusk. Really, it's more like a tooth, a, a tusk like from a walrus. Uh, incredibly long, five feet, six feet long. Um, many people believed in, in the olden days, you know, uh, three, four, five, six hundred years ago and, and before, that the, the, the tusk of the narwhal, the, the, the horn of the narwhal, uh, that the, the horn produced uh, medicinal properties. Many believed magical properties. So they would take the horn, crush it up, put it in, in medicines, uh, make potions. Could that be the unicorn based on the passages? No. Why not? Yeah, it talks about things that happen on the land, not things that happen in the water, unless this thing can jump out and do stuff. And Yeah. Okay, we have the New International Version out. I don't necessarily think that's the best version. Uh, just for sake of discussion, in case it's ever a question, do I believe that the New International Version is the Word of God? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Do I believe that the King James Bible is the Word of God? Yes, I do. Do I believe that the New World Translation of the Scriptures is the Word of God? No, that's the Jehovah's Witness Bible. Do I believe that the Book of Mormon is the Bible? No. Do I believe, treading on shaky ground here, the Revised Standard Version. Now, some, if you've studied a little bit, you know that, that, that uh, new Revised Standard Version, uh, New American Standard Version, there are so English, Revised English Standard, they all have little quirks. There's a reason that the translators kind of went off in a different direction. I don't believe that your Bible contains the Word of God. I believe that your Bible is the Word of God. The difference is, if you give God authority to be the boss over you, He's not the boss over you. Not if you gave Him the authority. If you give me authority to be your pastor, that's one thing, because I'm just one of you. I'm, it's just us. But, but for us to give someone that God tells us to submit to, and I give them that authority, well, that really makes me the authority. You know what I mean? We need to be really careful. When we say we're the judge over what's the truth and what's not the truth, we may be well-intentioned. We may be thinking, oh, I believe God's word from cover to cover. But if a lot of people think I'm doing this because I'm not charismatic Pentecostal. I talked to a, a, a lady this morning. I don't know if you're here. Did I talk to you this morning? The lady who called, someone gave her my number, and that always scares me. Someone gave me your number, and I thought, oh, no. <laughs> I start thinking what I do, what I do. Uh, someone gave her my number because she's interested in a church. Uh, and her first questions were, do you speak in tongues, lay hands on people, get slain in the spirit? No. I took a breath. I said, no. I mean, does she want the long version, the short version? And, and then I, I talked a little bit, not because I'm trying to convince her to come, but because I believe that God brought her to my pulpit. Hello? Yeah. And, and that I, I have a responsibility to, to help her see the truth, not to not be charismatic or Pentecostal. But the reason I'm not charismatic Pentecostal is because of the way I interpret the Bible. Now, if I'm interpreting the scriptures incorrectly, and my charismatic Pentecostal friends are interpreting it correctly, then I need, to, I need to bend what I believe to fit the truth, not to fit their way or what I'm comfortable with. She talked about experience that she's had. And you know me, I'm so sensitive. I don't care what experiences you've had. I didn't say that. But you know me. Your experiences could be from God. They could be from Satan. They could be from anchovies on the pizza. They could be from chemical imbalances. Right? They could be from, a, I don't know, flashback from Nam. I, maybe it's God the Holy Spirit. But why live in the realm of the subjective when you can stay right in the center of God's word? All right. The New International Version is what we use here. I use it because this is, the New International Version was written for a seventh grade kind of thinking. 
right? So it stretches the third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade thinking, and it's easy enough for us to grasp. Still difficult enough. That's one of the main reasons I use the NIV. I use the NIV because it's not a paraphrase. It's not, uh, he makes Lebanon leap like a calf, Syrian like a wild ox. Well, in other words, the Bible is talking about uh, how just like the... Uh, uh, the unicorn uh, is, is strong but swift, and it can leap with its strength. It's graceful. And, and, and in, in, in other words, and I start explaining, that's what a paraphrase is. A paraphrase is, well, in other words, the NIV is not a paraphrase. The NIV takes the Greek and the Hebrew and explains it in a way that, that, that we would probably understand as a 7th, 8th, ninth grade reader, right? and tries to stay faithful to the Hebrew, tries to stay faithful to the Greek, but instead of going word for word, the, uh, the black cat ate the cow. The, L, black cat, negro gato, ate, ate O. The, okay, now you know, right, that you can't take Spanish and go word for word, right? Uh, the, the, what, the noun comes first, the adjective comes after, so it wouldn't be the black cat, it would be the cat black ate the cow, right? Um, the NIV takes that into consideration, and so it doesn't try to give you a word-for-word -word corresponding from the Hebrew and the Greek straight down to the English. It gives you the dynamic sense of what, of what that phrase means. Does that make sense? I mean, am I making sense? The new, uh, the, that's the new international version. The new American standard is more wooden, uh, you know, like unflexible. So in the new American standard, it might say the cat, which was black, ate the cow, which was not. You know, it would sound kind of stiff, but it would be more accurate. Does that make sense? Careful. Don't let your belief of God's word somehow undermine the integrity of God's word. You can believe whatever you believe, but it doesn't affect the truth. You can believe whatever you want to believe. It doesn't mess with God in his veracity, in his faithfulness, in his integrity. I believe, I believe that your Bible, whatever Bible you're using, unless it's from a cult, you know, from some dude who just, I think I'm going to trick people, you know, like Joseph Smith. Your Bible doesn't contain the word of God because then, you're responsible to go digging around. Ah, that's not God's word. But that's not God. Okay, maybe that's God's word. Nah. Your Bible doesn't contain God's word. Your Bible is God's word. Or you're in trouble. Because then you're God. You are, you're the judge. So that's one of the reasons that we're digging around a little bit. Uh, from the NIV, this is on the, in the back, I think, isn't it? The back of your study guide. Um, unicorn in the New International Version. So I'm going to look at the very same passages, not from the King James, but now from the... NIV, Isaiah 34, 7, and the unicorn, what does it say? And the wild oxen, the cow, the wild ox, a hairy cow will fall with them and the bull calves and great bulls. Their land will be drenched with blood and the dust will be soaked with fat. Numbers 23, 22, God, God brought them out of Egypt. They will have the strength of a wild ox. Now that makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, a wild ox is strong. It doesn't look like that lap dog with a horn. You know? God brought them out of Egypt. They have the strength of a wild ox. Doesn't that make sense? Now, why is God even bringing up a wild ox? Why is God even talking about a unicorn? You want to look at the sense of the passage. What is it talking about? Who cares whether they're UFOs or, or poltergeists or unicorns in the Bible? Well, well, it matters if God put it there. But the reason that he mentioned unicorns or oxen or whatever they are is because God is saying, I, I, God is conveying the idea of strength. He's as strong as an ox. He's using something familiar to explain something that's not quite so familiar. When they came out, they came out with the strength of a galababa. Uh, I'm sorry? What, did I didn't stutter galababa. What the heck? We need an interpreter here. We... If I want to explain something that's strong, I want to use something that you'll, you'll kind of get. They came out and came against me and pushed my car with the strength of, of an elephant. And you go, Halabodi, that was big and strong. And Galaba Baba, ah, what's that? God used 
in the King James, he used the idea of a single horned, a, 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 a one horned creature that was familiar to them to explain they came out with strength. If I tell you they came out with the strength of an ox, you'd get it. Well, God did the same thing. Evidently, a unicorn was familiar when he said this. Now, I don't think it was like Pegasus with a horn, you know, flying horses, you know, my little pony. Numbers 24, 8, God brought them out of Egypt. They have the strength of a wild ox. They devour uh, hostile nations and break their bones in pieces. With their arrows, they pierce them. Strength, Deuteronomy 33, 17. In majesty, he's like a firstborn bull. His horns are like the horns of a wild ox. Strength again. With him, he will gore the nations. Wow. Even those at the ends of the earth, such are the ten thousands of Ephraim, such are the thousands of Manasseh, Job 39, 9. Will the wild ox consent to serve you? Can you get the wild ox to sit on your lap? And come here, come here, wild ox. He'll gore you. Will it stay by your, your uh, refrigerator, your manger? Remember a manger? Uh, they laid Jesus in a manger, and so we, we think it's a crib. Literally, it's where you feed the animals. Will, will, the, will the wild ox lay down in your barn at night next to your manger? Can, can you hold the wild ox to plow in a straight row? No way. You can't even put a harness. You can't put a yoke on that thing. Will it till the valleys behind you? It'll run over you. Psalm twenty two twenty one. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. Save me from that little lapdog with a thing sticking out of its head. The idea conveyed is strength, fearsome strength, awesome strength, awe-inspiring strength. Psalm 29, 6, he makes Lebanon leap like a calf, Syrian like a young wild ox. Psalm 92, 10, you have exalted mine horn like that of a wild ox. Fine oils have been poured on me, Isaiah 34, 7. And the wild oxen will fall with them, the bull calves, uh, calves and the great bulls. Their land will be drenched with blood and the dust will be soaked with fat. So you kind of get the idea, right? Uh, what about this next video? Um, One animal. There are, as I understand it, uh, a couple of animals alive today. Uh, the Indian in India and in Java, there are rhinoceroses, rhinoceri, rhinoceroses that have one horn. Most that we see have two. The big one in the front, little one in the back. In India and in Java, there are hippopotamuses alive today that have one horn. Next video, please. Now, when you read unicorn, do you picture that? But the word uni, unicycle, bicycle, bicycle has how many wheels? Two. Unicycle has one. Rhino, have you ever heard of somebody getting rhinoplasty? It's a... Yeah, they fix the nose. Rhino is nose. Rhino, keros, that here, seros, means horn. Right? It's a nose horn. It's a, right? That's all rhinoceros is. Now, there are species of rhinoceros that have two horns. There are species of rhinoceroses that only have one, right? It's a one-horned rhinoceros. Uh, next video. In Fort Worth, Texas, you can get you a unicorn well, actually, you can't, but you can get close to one. Literally, a unicorn, cornice, uh, cornucopia. Can you picture a cornucopia? It's one of those straw horns that you put fruit in at Thanksgiving. I don't know. We always colored them in school. I don't know. A cornucopia, a cornucopia, cornice is a horn. Yeah, that's what it means. Uh, unicorn, uni, one, cornice, horn, one horn. That's all it literally means. All we know for sure is the creature that was real, not aquatic, but land animal, had one horn, was strong, strong as an ox, <laughs> fearful, awe-inspiring, and it was familiar to the people of that day because God used it to explain something that they weren't familiar with. He used a familiar thing to help them understand something they weren't familiar with. It wasn't a gabla babla ba. It was a unicorn. Oh, wow! That strong a unicorn, not with, with, with wings or without, you know, with a rainbow over it. So in Fort Worth, uh, there are uh, uh, a couple of, uh, there's a mama and a baby uh, unicorn, rhinoceros. Now, is that what the Bible's talking about? I don't know. 
um, many believe, and the more I dig around, I kind of lean toward this next video. Uh, there, there have been fossils found of something called uh, Elasmotherium. It's basically a rhinoceros with lots of hair. Imagine an elephant and a woolly mammoth that was found in the Arctic tundra. It's basically an elephant with a lot of hair. This is a rhinoceros with a lot of hair. This is what they found. And the, the, the fossil remains, the skeletal remains, showed one single huge mammoth jammer horn. Now, they've been extinct for a long time. So this dude went into the past. This is a BBC uh, documentary, and uh, so they, they take a lot of liberty. So th this is not a real. But if he does, he could charge. Alasmatherium, but based uh, on a, uh, it's a reconstruction from what they found. And he'd have no hesitation about charging and panning me with that. Go ahead and bring it up. That would really spoil my weekend. Oh, he's got his eye on something much bigger to take back to the park. This is his chance to save the Elasmotherium from extinction, but it means taking a huge risk and using himself as bait. That's his time machine. Just in case you didn't understand. Now, what other church is talking about this? I'm not sure, but I think that's unicorn poop in this bag. Not real sure. Now, could that fit the description of what we found in the Bible? The rhinoceros is found in... <laughs> oh, I love both. The right, <laughs> the brought him home. Yay! Still extinct. So the the one-horned uh, rhinoceros uh, from India or from Java, I guess, could be the unicorn, but not not real common to Israel. Yeah. Um, evidently, the unicorn was right. Uh, Alasmotherium, uh, now extinct, like many other animals that are now extinct. The dodo bird. Right? Extinct is a dead as a dodo bird. Well, there's no such. I mean, dodo birds are gone. They're gone. Uh, dinosaurs extinct, unless lizards are dinosaurs. I kind of lean that way myself. But uh, um, I I wonder if something like that might best fit the biblical description of what a unicornus would be. So why is the unicorn even mentioned in Scripture? Job thirty nine nine through twelve. Will the unicorn be willing to serve thee or abide by thy crib, that is, where you feed your animals? Canst thou bind the unicorn with his band in the furrow? Can you put a leash on a unicorn? Will he, will he plow? Will he harrow the valleys after? Will he follow after you and plow the valleys? Will you trust him because his strength is great? Will you leave the work of your field to him? Will you believe in him? Will he bring home thy seed and gather it into thy barn? He's strong, he's fearful, he's fearsome. Is he, is, he, is he a thinking creature? No, he's a strong, brute beast that'll kill you tomorrow, Rock. He'll kill you to death. He'll kill you to death. There we go, I finally got it out. That was from the great theologian Mickey from Rocky. <laughs> He'll kill you to death, Rock. The unicorn is not going to follow you. The unicorn is not going to obey you. The unicorn is not going to let you get on his back and let you fly around with rainbows. And the unicorn was not a mythical, fantastical, fictional creature. The unicorn was a real land animal that was strong and fearsome, had one horn, and God used it as an example of awesome, fearsome, fearful strength. In the book of Job, uh, you remember the story, right? Uh, I think this is in your study guide. Satan buffets Job in uh, chapters 1 and the first part of chapter 2. Uh, uh, Satan uh, comes before the Lord in heaven, and God asks Satan, Dude, where you been? Satan says, Ah, going to and fro on the earth, just checking things out. And God says, What do you think of my servant? Can you imagine him saying your name? God 
ask Satan, what do you think of my servant Job? Because Job was so what? Righteous. Can you imagine God saying, hey, Satan, what do you think of my servant Tony? <laughs> Got him, huh? Got him where I want him, don't I, God? What do you think of my servant Job? Satan didn't say he's not holy, he's not righteous. He said he doesn't serve you for nothing. He's faithful to you because you're faithful to him. He lives for you because you're blessing him. Really? God says, what are you thinking? Let me touch him. Let me take stuff. Let me take stuff away from him. Watch him curse you to your face. Orale, go. Or something like that in the Hebrew. And so Satan comes down, beats the snot out of Job, right? Uh, loses his kids, loses his uh, wealth, loses his uh, resources, uh, loses his farms. His kids lose their farms. It's just it's total devastation, right? And yet Job does not curse God, right? And God asks Satan, what do you think of my servant Job? Yet he is faithful. Satan says, yeah, skin for skin, baby. You let me touch his health and you watch him curse you. You watch him turn from you. Go for it, God said, like that. So Satan comes down, and he touches Job, and the guy gets so sick. I mean, he wants to die. He hurts so bad. He burns so bad with the boils, with the sores, with the cuts, with the oozing, pussy, nasty, uh, that the only relief he can find is to go to the dump and find pieces of flower pot and scrape. You ever find yourself rubbing up against the wall and I can't reach it, I can't reach it. So you have the scratch. Greg gave me a back scratcher. Like, oh, right there, right there, right there. Ay, 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 ay. Nobody can reach it except that back scratcher. Ay, 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 ay. But what is it when you're in so much pain? You try to scratch, you bite your finger, you bite your tongue, you would do almost anything. That's where Satan pushed Job. Job cursed the day he was born. He hated his life. He hated the dirt he was walking on. He hated the hairs of his head. But never once did he curse God. Though God slay me, yet will I serve him. Ha! It's pretty cool. Satan buffets Job. And then Job's friends come to encourage him. Oh, Job, what does he do? And now at first they really, they just came, they, they just gave him a hug. They didn't touch him because he hurt so bad. They just came and they sat down in the ashes at the dump with Job. They just sat with him for days. They didn't eat. They didn't speak. And then Job starts feeling sorry for himself again. I mean, it's understandable. I mean, this is, a, the, I guess, the world's most righteous dude. And he's starting to feel kind of, this isn't right. It's not fair. It's not, he didn't curse God. But man, he hated everything else. He hates his life. In chapter 4 through 37, the friends try to help a brother out. Ugh. They tell Job, Job, just confess, man. What did you do that was so bad? I didn't do anything. Come on, Job. God doesn't do this to people unless they did something really bad. I'm telling you, I didn't do anything, Job. Come on. And they keep trying to convince him to come up with something. Surely you did something. For how many chapters? 33 chapters? They sit with him for half a chapter, 33 chapters, and beat the snot out of Job emotionally. And if that's not bad enough, God opens his mouth and he humbles Job. Job acknowledges his pride, and in the end, God blesses Job. All right, that, that's basically what happens. All right. In your study guide there, you have that Satan buffets Job, friends encourage Job, Job hates life, friends correct Job, Job, uh, God humbles Job, Job, I don't know why it's Job and not Job. Because that's what they told me to say, Job. But it looks like Job to me. God blesses Job. All right, chapters 38, 1 through 38. So this is kind of a, a little uh, close-up now on what we just said. In chapter 38 of Job, God humiliates Job by challenging Job's knowledge of God's creation. Now, now uh, bear with me here. Satan goes to God. God asks where you've been, going to and fro in the earth. God says, what do you think of my servant Job? Yeah, he doesn't serve you for nothing. God says, go ahead, touch him. Now, you know that God will build and hedge against them? Yeah. I know that verse is in the Bible. Don't be taking somebody else's check to the bank. You're going to go to jail. Don't be taking a valid check that's got money in the bank. It's written to somebody else and try to cash it. Don't be taking a promise that God made to somebody else in the Bible and claim it for your own. 
Jeremiah, I know the plans I have for you to bless you and not curse you. It's to Jeremiah. I know, it makes you mad. Uh, in John, in the little text messages, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, uh, I pray that you'd be, pro you know, you'd be prosper, that you'd be healthy. Uh, God wants everybody to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. No. Well, we're going to be looking Sunday morning at, at John the Baptist, and, and, and I was reminded again, you know, God doesn't necessarily want you healthy. God doesn't necessarily want you financially comfortable. This is not the game. This is not what it's about. This life is not what it's about. Preparing you in this life for the life to come is what it's about. God may want you to suffer. God may want you to die for His glory. Paul got it. The Apostle Paul said, Lord, by my life or by my death, just so that you're magnified and glorified. But we, we're taught, not, not just charismatic Pentecostal, well-intentioned Baptist preachers too. You know, God wants to bless you. God wants to bless you. God wants to just serve him. Get on God's side. God wants to bless you. God wants to favor you. God, yeah, whatever. Sometimes God intends for you to suffer. Sometimes God intends for us to be slain because God's glory is number one. God humiliated Job. Because Job stood up in all of this and he said, you know what, guys, to his friends, I know this about God. I know this about you. I know this about me. And by the way, I know this about God and I know this about you. And that sounds like me. And I know this about, give me a chalkboard and a piece of chalk. I know more than God. Come, come here, let me show you. That's the way Job was sounding. And God went over to Job and said, hey, hey, just a minute, God. I'm telling, I'm schooling these boys here. Job, hey, can we? I'll be right back. Job walks over to God and God says, dude, shut up. Like that. Job, what got into you? You were doing so well. Job, you want to thus saith the Lord? Here we go. Shut up. And he tells him that. I said, Job, tell me, dude, you know everything about me. I mean, you're telling your friends like, you know, we're like that. Tell, I'm going to ask you questions about the planet that I created, Job. What do you, about the oceans, Job? Tell me about light. Tell me how I created light. Tell me where I store it. Let's talk about the snow. Let's talk about the rain. And God humiliated Job. The righteous, the righteousness, the most righteous man on the planet. He humiliated him. What does the Bible say? If we humble ourselves, in due time God will exalt us. But if we're filled with pride. He'll knock us down. He humbles us, which is nice for humiliates us. Yeah, He loves us that much. He wants our lives to glorify Him, whether by our lives or our death. God wants us to glorify Him. He's not an egotistical, maniacal, monster God. He's a good God. He's a loving God. But He's God. He's not just love. He's holiness and righteousness. We forget that. He's not your bud. Buddy's my buddy, but God's not your buddy. Jesus is your brother, but he's not your bro. He is the Lord God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. He is God Almighty. And he reminded Job, dude, shut up. You got answers? What about this, right? This is what he did. In chapters 38, 39 and following, uh, well, verse, uh, yeah, that's right, 38 and following, God humiliated Job then by challenging his knowledge not, not just over God's creation, but of God's creatures. Uh, Job, let's talk about the lions. Let's talk about how I created the raven and the goat and the donkey. Hey, Job, let's talk about the great unicorn. Let's talk about the ostrich. Let's talk about the horse. Let's talk about the hawk. And in chapter 40, the Lord said to Job, will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Job, you know so much. Dude, do you realize you're, you're challenging me? No, I'm not. Shut up. Answer me. Shut up. You know, like that. Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? God is asking Job. Let him who accuses God answer him. Three, Job answered the Lord. I bet like that. I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? 
I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer. Okay, I spoke twice. I will say no more. God put Job in his place. So in chapter 40, God humiliates Job further by challenging what Job believes about God's behemoth. Next week we'll talk about behemoth. He challenged Job's knowledge of God's Leviathan. Behemoth was, we'll talk about it next week, it was a land creature, big, mighty, many people believe a dinosaur. Uh, Leviathan, many, well, what we know for sure from Scripture, mighty, fearful, awesome, awe-inspiring. Behemoth was a land creature. Leviathan was a sea creature, right? Sea monster. Why is a unicorn mentioned in Scripture? God is pointing out, you're not as strong as you think you are. You're not as big as you think you are. You don't have me figured out the way you think you have me figured out, Tony, Job. Yeah, teach what you think you know, but you don't know everything you think you know. Why do you think the unicorn is no longer mentioned in Scripture? Why, why do you think that the newer versions don't mention unicorns? What's that? Most people picture a unicorn that way. And, and is that a unicorn? We don't know, but probably not. I mean, you can tame that. I see cowboys do it all the time on TV. Watch the horn, but... <laughs> but <laughs> the unicorn could not be tamed. Why is the unicorn no longer mentioned in Scripture? Quick answer. I believe Satan is trying to destroy the Scripture, and he can't. So he'll try to dilute it. He'll try to make the scripture uh, not as strong. Have you ever been so excited, man? You go in a lot of burger and you, ah, double meat, cheese, well done. Okay, maybe a little green chili, regular fries, and a Coca-Cola. And you sit down, you're all excited, and you, it's hot outside, and you take that Coke, and it is like water. You know, where's the, it's not Coke. Who snuck Diet Coke in my, or it's, you know, watered down, you know, the syrup is, I believe Satan is watering down scripture. The King James, you know, the authorized 16, we couldn't read the authorized 1611. You know, the, the U's are V's and the W's are X's and, you know, you, it is just hard to read. It's, it's, spellings are different, words mean something else. So it's been revised many times. I, I'm not saying that to undermine your um, uh, trust in the King James Bible. I'm telling you, you can trust God. Well, there's a typo in my Bible. That's okay. It's okay. God promised not only to present His Word to us, but to protect it, to preserve it, and to propagate His own truth, which is one of the reasons I think speaking in tongues is so dangerous. I don't just think it's silly. I think it's dangerous because if you truly honest to Pete, and I'm talking to people online and you guys here, if you honest to Pete believe that God is giving you a word from above, why the heck is that not as authoritative as what I find in here? Because this is God's word. If God told you something and it didn't work out, you think God made a mistake? You just make him look like a fool. I care about your experiences, but... When the lady that I was speaking to this morning, she told me about some experiences that she had. She didn't believe in tongues. She didn't believe in being slain in the spirit. She didn't believe in any of that. But someone asked, can I pray for you? And she was kind of, well, I said, okay. And they prayed for her. Son of a gun. She prayed in tongues. She was slain in the Holy Ghost. Her hands went up. And I asked her, I, I, I'm just curious. Had you never been around anything like that? And she said, no. But I asked her further. She was going to a church like that. Challenge me all you want. I, we can talk at length if you want. I challenge you to find me somebody, except someone in a heathen cult, some jungle somewhere on the planet, because unbelieving cult members speak in tongues. Unbelieving, scary religious groups around the world, they're slain in some spirit. They have visions. They get possessed by the spirit, some spirit. I challenge you to find one person. Maybe you're one. I, I've just never met one. I challenge you to find one person who's ever experienced any of these charismatic Pentecostal experiences that they hadn't already seen it. 
or been encouraged to do it. Some people have literally been taught how to speak in tongues. Some, you, raising your hands, I know it's in Scripture. That is a learned experience. People don't naturally do that. It's okay if you do it. I'm just telling you, I, I challenge you to find somebody who just did that. They do it because they're around people who do it, and they've, they've been taught that's how you praise the Lord. Okay, I was taught that's what you do when you don't want the burglar to shoot you. I know it sounds like I'm being sarcastic and silly, but it's a learned experience, to, unless it's demonic. I don't believe that speaking in tongues is from God the Holy Spirit today. If it is, it's going to fit inside His regulations in 1 Corinthians. In a church service, not a prayer closet. In a church service, two people in an entire service. Never more than three, one at a time. Only if there's somebody there who understands Spanish, like you're going to speak, or Chinese, or I can't even think of any more language. German, Russian, some dialect. It was Swahili. It was a known language, unknown to the speaker. It's a miracle, but known to somebody in the congregation. That's why Paul said through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, if there's no one there who understands it in that language, if there's no one there who needs to hear it in that language, shut up. Well, it's just me and God, me and angels. When Paul said that, he was being sarcastic. What the heck, you're talking to angels? Oh, yeah. I know. I challenge you. Any of you watching online, any of you guys, find me one person who does this or who has spoken in tongues or slain in the spirit who wasn't taught that that was the normal thing for those to do. You know what I mean? I'm not just being, I'm t same in Baptist churches. You can't get right with God until Sunday morning during the 23rd verse of Just As I Am. Come forward during the altar call. You don't need an altar call to get right with God. Get right with God. Like God's on vacation until Sunday morning after they start singing, Just As I Am. <laughs> this verse is for you. Now, if you just need someone to pray for you, come on. And if you need Jesus, and they start, it's like they're priming the pump. Altar workers, come on. Come on, you just, God's blessed you, come forward and pray. Come on. Shoot, I, I know how to work. <laughs> yes, I see that hand. Yeah. You feel that? That's the tugging of the Holy Ghost. You feel that? Uh. We've, seen, uh, we've seen people get taught how to speak in tongues. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's sad. It's sad. Because people seriously, truly want to serve God. They want to follow God. So the husband came forward, and he wasn't speaking in tongues, and disappointed. Oh, yeah, in some churches, they're taught that if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved, because they're taught that's the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, no. It's a manifestation of some spirit. I know that's mean. I know it's mean. I'm going to lose half of you guys, and the rest of you guys watching online love you, but no, I, I keep coming, keep coming. I want you to grow. Man, if you grew up in a Baptist church, you're a Baptist preacher, you're a charismatic, it doesn't matter. Grow from where you are. That's what God's expecting of me from wherever I am. Grow. Job, you don't have it all figured out. I believe the reason unicorns are no longer mentioned in Scripture is because Satan is doing what he can to dilute the truth. He can't. You stand on God's word. Stand on God's word. Stand on God's word. Actually, that's it. Father, help us stand on your word. Tongues, no tongues, the Holy Ghost, goosebumps, whatever. But God, help us stand on the truth of your word, not some experience that could have come because well-intentioned people encouraged us to do it. Or maybe some, 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 God, it doesn't matter. What matters is where we are right now and where we go from here. Lord God, creator of heaven and earth, I pray that everyone watching online, every person in this building, everyone who will ever hear or watch this message will turn to you in faith, repent of their sin, give their heart and life to you, trust you for salvation, and then grow from there. God, I pray that we would immerse ourselves in your word yeah, TV preachers, radio preachers, the Bible, other sermons.
But God, more than anything else, help us learn to compare the Bible with the Bible. Help us learn to compare Scripture with other Scriptures. We can't help but understand the Bible the way we were taught to understand it. We can't help it. We can't help but interpret the Bible the way we were taught to interpret it. God, I pray you would surround us with godly men and godly women, people who love you more than we love you, if that's possible, people who are a little smarter, a little sharper, a little stronger in the faith. And God, help us stay close to them that we might grow and learn by following their example as they follow the example of someone sharper and stronger and smarter than them, someone who's following someone sharper and smarter and stronger than they are. God, help us follow people around us who are following you even as uh, uh, they're following Christ. God, we want to do a better job of being that example. Help us get in your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I think I spoke in tongues. I don't know who was following who in my prayer, but you guys figure it out. <laughs> Again, uh, I just like this song. It has no spiritual anything. Um, Mary Ann's funeral, Saturday, 6 o'clock. If any of you would like to help uh, with the food preparation or the cleanup, uh, just let Jerry know and, and just be here and we'll thank you.